What's up, everyone? Welcome to Unmask, where things are discovered, uncovered, brought to the light, and made known. I'm your host, Lamar Barry, coming live to you from PG County, Maryland. If you're interested in finding out about the untold stories behind being a college coach, this is the show for you. Being a former assistant men's college basketball coach for 16 years, there are so many untold stories behind the scenes in the life of a college basketball coach. Now, let's unmask them. Today's guest is a young and bright assistant coach and a Baltimore, Maryland native, Patrice Days. Now, Patrice, uh, you know, he, he's a, um, a guy who graduated from University of New Orleans uh, right around 2010. Um, he uh, then went over to Charlotte, UNC Charlotte, uh, where he was uh, in a, uh, you know, graduate assistant, uh, player personnel development role, uh, got a chance to get on the floor. Uh, and then in the 2011-12 season, he went over to uh, Vermont Academy, and he also split time at Mac Prep uh, down in the Charlotte area. And then from 12-13, he went over to one of the best programs uh, in uh, high school basketball in all of the country day. We had an outstanding run there um, with, a, with a ton of Division One basketball players. And from there, he went to Abilene Christian, first full-time assistant job uh, in college basketball. Uh, where he spent two years at Abilene Christian. And from there, he went on to Wright State, where he worked uh, alongside Billy Dunlin, uh, who's now the head coach at UMKC for a year. And then he was at Southern Utah uh, for one year. And then now president for the last three years. He's been at Coastal Carolina, where he's doing an outstanding job. Um, I just want to say welcome to the show, Patrice. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me, man. Um, you know what, man? We'll get right into it, man. Let's go ahead and get unmasked. Uh, first question I'd like to ask is you was thrown into uh, the mix, you know, early, even though once you got out. Um, there's no handbook to being a college coach. Like, um, tell me about the first day, first week, first month, after things are done with human resources and, and, and orientation, especially when no one gives you direction. Like, you might have, you've had family members or friends that's been in the business, but until you in it, and then that was your turn. Like, tell me what that was like when 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 no one gives you direction. Oh uh, man, my heart was racing my, like my first day. Like I was I was I was more so uh, excited than uh than nervous. Like I was like I was just I I had so much energy. I was like all over the place, and I'm the type of person I take the bull by his horn. So. Like before coach had a chance to tell me he wanted me to do this, do that, I was just already doing it. And to be honest with you, I, you know, most guys, they, they like to ask, you know, what is it going to be like and this, that, and the third. No, I, I just like, I just went straight forward to it and, and just kind of showed them I had confidence in what I was doing. Um, I think that helped me out a lot, you know, early on, you know, with having me to be on the floor and uh, because I just, you know, Working for some of the guys I work for, you know, they, they like that. But I had no idea. It was just a part of who I was. Awesome, man. Like, we all know that recruiting is the lifeline of college athletics. You got to get good players. and You got to get good people if you want to win games. Um, so, you know, you know that, uh, I mean, what, what was your best and worst recruiting story? Ooh. <laughs> uh... My best recruiting story was K.J. Moore. If people don't know the, the uh, Puerto Rican kid. He was with us at All the Country Day, five foot seven, 135 pounds, soaking wet. When I first got on at, uh, at Abilene, I begged and begged Joe Golden to take a shot at him. Yeah, he watched him on film, film, and he was like, you crazy. Like, no, he can't play this and the third. And I, I was like, Coach, I swear to you. He's like, would you put your job on the line? And I said, hell yeah. <laughs> now, that's, that's just me being confident. Now, my, most kids, you just you probably won't do that for, but I just seen the kid win so much. Coach Golden went down there, and, and at the time, you know, him and Matt Figure are really good friends. That's how I got on at Abilene Christian. Uh, they there together, and KJ is throwing dimes left and right, and, and Coach is talking to me on the phone. You better get this SOB. <laughs> he like, you better, you better find a way. You better talk to Rex. We need him. We need him. And then he came back. That's all he talked about for a whole week. And to me, it was like, you know, 
that right there, you know, that, that gave me a lot of confidence, you know, but the pressure was on me, but I believed in the kids so much. Um, and then obviously when I left, he, he became a success story afterwards. But uh, if you ask Joe Golden, that was one of his, his favorite basketball players. And recruiting, I go out on a limb and talk about my guys from New Orleans. Uh, I was at ACD, and it was a kid named LaDamian Keys. And Greg and Kobe, they grilled me so much because I wanted to break in and, and get in that, into that circle. They, they know me because I was in New Orleans and I played this, you know, and I was around with Charles Camus and uh, Charles Hammock and those guys that they basically kind of brought up. And they wanted to see where my heart was. So they brought me in the hood <laughs> to go recruit the Damien Keys. Now I'm a Baltimore native and you going in the hood in New Orleans is one where they brought me at is over in the West Bank is one way in and one way out. And you talking about my heart racing, my heart was racing. I was like, man, I ain't never seen no hood hood like this ever. And people that know about New Orleans, they got neutral rats. They like rats about the size of puppies. And I seen them join, I like, yeah, this is the real hood. And the fact that I went down there and, and to them, it was like I was in my element. They was like, man, you got a lot of heart. You like, you, you real, you, you, you're a real dude. And from that point, you know, for the future, we were good. But you talking about like people talking about I me. Mean, I ain't scared enough in this and the third. And I was nervous as I don't know what. I've been been a lot of parts of New Orleans. That part, I was like, yeah. I was like, all right, man. You get, you know, this is what it's really like, you know. So uh, I think they gave me a check mark with them dudes. But that was to me. I couldn't like leaving afterwards. That couldn't. That probably wouldn't end well. You know what I mean? If I didn't do well with them dudes. So uh, those are the two most memorable stories I can think of. Awesome, man. Awesome. Um what do you had what did you have to give up to um achieving your current level of success? Uh time from family, uh my personal life. Um well a lot. Like a lot of people don't know I was like I was homeless. And when I say homeless like I had a I basically gave up my last year of playing at Southern University at New Orleans to go to be a walk-on grad assistant, GA, whatever Joe Pashnack wanted me to be. And uh, at the time, they had a plan for me to be like an RA, and it didn't work out. It didn't work out the way that that was supposed to. I was like one point off from being an RA, and I had nowhere to stay. So I was basically homeless. And... My family thought it was crazy that I forfeited my scholarship to finish up to go to New Orleans. So I had a pride thing where I didn't want to go back and ask them, you know, for anything. A lot of people don't know. You know I got ties with, you know, people like Antoine Jameson and you know, some people know Kevin Norris, uh, who people know as Stink and Shanti Ross. They all professional basketball players who could have, you know, pitched a little something to help me. I had my pride and I just like, you know, I'm not going to ask somebody for no help. So I basically slept on the couch. For six months and I worked so hard that Joe Pashnak and the AD at the time, uh, Ola, who's now the AD at uh, Southeastern, they found a way to come up with some money and give me a, a, a place to live. So I sacrificed a lot of my my, my senior year um, to, to get into college coaching because I, I knew I had a plan. And why well, I wouldn't even say I had a plan. I knew I, I wanted it bad enough. I didn't know how I was going to get it, but I was going to figure it out. So I had to make a lot of sacrifices, and that was the probably one of the most hardest things I've, I, I've had to do. Wow. Wow. That's, that's, that's something, you know, you, you learn. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you shared that information. Um, scout report. We all know that, um, you know, you can always tell when it's that person's scout report. Um, how they jumping up and down, they screaming and yelling, and <laughs> Um, what, you know, and, and you, like, you can do your best scout report and sometimes players just, you know, like you prepare, you got calls, you know, you, you know, you yelling and screaming on the bench and you like, you know, you can do your best and guys just don't come and perform or you can have some moments you miss some stuff. Um, you know, guy shot, you know, three for his last 35 threes and you like, yeah, coach, you really not a shooter, you know? And, and so guys listen to you and it's like, um, yeah, 
you know, they, they don't play, they don't guard him as hard. They play off him, they give him shots. And then you see guys make three, four threes, coach turning around you and say, not a shooter, huh? So what was your best and worst scouting report? Ooh, I go on the limb, I'm going to say my worst. And it was against uh, Kentucky. So Billy, Billy uh, gave me the Kentucky scout. And at the time, I wasn't great. I was okay. But he was trying to force me to be great. And he gave me the scout report. I gave it to him. I was so hyped. I, I watched so much film, and I gave it to him. And he said, this ain't good enough. Like, you got too much stuff, and it's too, too, too detailed. And I'm looking at him like, what are you talking about? So then I put less in it. And he grilled me so much, and he was playing so many mind games with me just to see how confident I was. And at the time, I wasn't confident. Um, and we actually, we actually did well that game. But I can tell you, uh, my scouting report wasn't to his liking. And I remember, I, I lied to you, and I, I, I cried in my office. I did. I cried in my office because I wanted, to, I wanted, to, I wanted to win. That was so bad, and I wanted to be sharp. And I thought, like at the end of the day, he told me it was good. But at the same time, I felt like, well, maybe if it was better and I was more prepared, we could have probably beat them. Because uh, it was at some point in time, like I think Calipari was actually talking about, you know, I had to keep Tyler Ulysses in the game where they were going to beat us. Because at one point in time, they were they were up twenty when he was in there, and then when he was out we would bring the game to like six to eight, like it was a close game. So like, I didn't, I didn't know how to game plan for Tyler Ewis. And I couldn't figure out that it was Tyler Ewis and Jamal Murray at the time. And we me and coach was going back and forth. He was like, are you calling him a shooter, but he's shooting whatever for the field. And I'm like, coach, I know he can shoot. I watched him in, in high school. And like coach didn't want to listen to me. So I felt that much confident, but I know what I know now, I didn't really know how to, take away things from Tyler Ewing. So that's why it was a bad scout report. That one was a bad one. Uh, and I would probably say the best one, ooh, uh, the best one might have been uh, against uh, URC. I had the, not URC, Detroit scout back when Ray McCollum was coaching in the championship game. Uh, we, we beat them at our place, and they beat us on a buzz at their place. And they had so many weapons. Um, I think it ultimately helped coach and the rest of our staff of, like, how to try to figure out different ways to possibly win um, because we had to play Oakland the, the following game. And to me, that was probably my best one because I knew it down to the T. Like, I knew everything. I knew all that play. I knew all that sets. I could see – certain things before they even called out plays. Like I knew it like the back of my hand. So that let, that gave me the confidence to to do other scouts because it's a pressure situation. I Like you have pressure situations you want to win, but that particular scout was like, all right, yeah, I got it now. You know what I mean? I, I, like I got it. Like from their personnel to the play calls, what they wanted to call out of time, was what he wanted to call late second. I looked at every – detail because I, I wanted to get to that championship game. So it was kind of like a player like who wanted to turn that light switch on. I, I, I had that thing on. I wasn't turning it on. I mean turning it off. So that was those those two are probably my most memorable moments as far as like scouting. Awesome man. Um what's the biggest challenge you've experienced since you become a college coach? Uh I'm a transparent person. I would say uh uh, the right state situation from getting there and now just being a recruiter and Billy molding me into a coach and then us getting fired. So I would talk about Billy uh, molding me into a coach. Billy molded me into a coach. He wouldn't let me go on the road at all, at all. I, I don't think I, I, I don't think I went on the road recruiting besides stuff that was local because like he wouldn't let us out of the office and, you know, he didn't tell me until after, you know, we got let go at Wright State to why. I didn't understand why. I was like, man, like, I, I can't, go, can't go recruiting. Like, this is what I do. I didn't understand it. And, you know, he had me in the office a bunch, teaching me to be more organized. I was organized, but I could have been sharper. And 
you know, the scouts, he was just throwing like, he threw some major scouts at me, you know, at the, at the time. Cause you got to think about it, you know, certain places they give you scouts because they know they're not going to win. They give it to the minority sometimes. No, Billy think he going to win all the games. So he gave me some, some really tough scouts, Xavier scout. I had that at the time. Ooh, that's when they had Christmas and they had, uh, I uh, can't remember the kid. Uh, they had they had some juggernauts. They was just they just rolled Alabama or somebody by like like twenty. Like we had them next. They were like top twenty five in the country. Matter of fact, we had Kentucky and then we had them a couple of games later. So like Billy molded me into a, a coach, and it was like it was the hardest thing. Like he pushed me on the floor. Like no, you can't you can't take your scouting report out there with you. You know you got this clipboard. You got you better know. You know what I mean. If I ain't have a dude kicking his feet out when he he come out that pin down and he's shooting, he grilling me on it. You know what I mean? So uh, I think that pressure uh, was 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 really challenging, and it made it easier for me. And then when we got fired at, at Rice State, I felt like we did everything we supposed to do, and that's, that's, that was really challenging as far as profession because we were 22 and 13, 13 and five in conference, tied for second in conference and lost in the championship game. And the only team to sweep Valpo, who, you know, Bryce Drew was the dude at the time. He was top 25. They had Alex Peters. And then we beat Oakland to get to the championship game. And they had – those are two pros that's in the horizon. So, to me, we did everything right, and things still went wrong. And I didn't understand it. So, my walk with my faith helped me get through those two challenging moments. Great stuff right there, man. Um, do you ever find that th there are things about you that people misunderstand? What are they? Now I'm a recruiter, and that uh, I would say they, they think that I have an angle. Now I'm real transparent. Uh, I know you heard it, and other people hear me say it all the time. God will bless you to bless others, and others to bless you. I don't have, you know, guys that – you know, I help kids go to junior college or prep school just to enter. I don't force those kids to try to come back to whatever situation. They're going to come come to me because they we have that relationship. You know what I mean? You can do some things, and I have uh, things that happen for you in return. Um, and it's a couple of guys that's at high levels, you know, coaches who know that. So, to me, you know, it's about helping other people, helping young men get where they want to get to. You know what I mean? It's not all about you. And it's not all about you. It's a movement. You know what I mean? So I think that's I think that's huge in recruiting. Like, I'm not just a recruiter. You know, I, I could do a lot of other things, too. You know, obviously, player development. I've been in a situation I've been able to scout. Um, I'm a more of a uh, defensive-minded coach. You know, I respect a lot of people who are defensive-minded guys. Um, like your your Bob Huggins, your Frank Martins, and even uh, I'm gonna say it anyway on a limb, <laughs> Danny Casper. You know, say what you want to, <laughs> regardless of what he got going on. Danny Casper, Danny Casper, he can coach a defensive mind and do so. Guys like that, you know, it's kind of like I, I like what they do. You know, tough, hard nose. We're gonna turn you over, and we're gonna have a party on the other on the floor. Awesome, man. What 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 do you try to teach your players besides basketball? Because we know we always like the life lesson stuff. Like, what what do you try to teach guys? Uh, me being a, a spiritual person, I would say a spiritual po a person. Like, you know, how to conduct themselves off the floor, being honest, uh, being authentic, uh, but also better than themselves. I think those are things, and being loyal. Uh, Loyal, loyalty and principle, I think, are the biggest things that I would say, you know, to them. You know, you know, I believe in God, family, basketball, in that order. So to to me, you know, I, I send them a lot of scriptures and stuff all the time. Now I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna cuss the ass out, but you know, I'm gonna be on them all the time. But you know, I'm a, I'm gonna let them know, like, hey man, this is a blessing to do what you you doing. So life lessons, I think they get life lessons from me. And they look at me as a mentor, big brother, father figure, and so forth. Uh, Family-wise, they, they see a lot of stuff I do. And, like, I walk it. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't just talk it. Awesome stuff, man. Um, 
What are your best and worst memories in coaching? Best memory in coaching? Ooh. Um, I would say my best memories is actually getting in. Like, I felt like I got that monkey on my back. Uh, all the stuff that I've been through and people said I couldn't do it. I remember LeBron once saying, he's like, I'm not supposed to be here, but I'm here. Like, I, I didn't play major college basketball. I wasn't a star. I was just a blue-collar, hard-nosed dude. I was Pat Beverly. <laughs> I, saw, well, I was Pat Beverly dude. You know what I mean? Except I wasn't as talented as he was. I just, just a tough, hard-nosed dude. And for me, that first day, like, I got on campus and I signed my contract. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, I got here. Like, I made it. Now, now what are you going to do? Um, that was, like, probably my most memorable moment. Like, I, I didn't know what to do. Like, I remember getting all the text messages at the time, you know, the, the stuff on Twitter and Instagram. Like, like, I was, like, overwhelmed. You know what I mean? Like, I, I felt like I, like, like I really accomplished a lot. Uh, the worst thing. The worst number of moments I would probably say is, like I said, uh, I would say it's tied up kind of like when I was at University of New Orleans and we went from D1 to D3 because I felt like we had a good enough team to win the Sun Belt at that time and the program folded and then what happened at Wright State. That thing that happened at Wright State was really rough because I, I felt like Billy, he didn't deserve to be fired. We had a good staff. We did things the right way. We had good kids, and you know, and we had a, a you no. Know, we lost in the championship game, and we had a great record. So, like to me, it's like it's you know, you tell kids all the time to keep on going, but I tell them like, man, hey, you go, things gonna go like you can take a make a thousand jump shots a day. Like you gonna have a bad game. It's gonna happen. Like you gonna go out there and shoot two for ten, but it's how you react to it afterwards. So. You know, and we did. We gave gave you the game plan. Y'all executed. They they made a buzzer beater. You know, it just happened. Everything you can do, you did everything right. You closed out the, with high hands. You know, you did what you supposed to. He still made the shot. So it's like you did everything. You did everything right, and things still went wrong. That was a tough pill for me to swallow so far in my in my career. Um, and this may tie into something early. It may not. You might have a different answer. What was the most stressful? situation you have faced? Ooh, stressful. Uh, I probably would say at Southern Utah. Southern Utah. Uh, because, you know, Tall was trying to, trying to uh, find an identity. And we were the worst team I've ever seen in my life. He inherited the worst team I've ever seen in my life. Abilene Christian, whether, you know, my first few years, we had more Division One basketball players. And so it was so stressful trying to teach those guys. They didn't know how to win. They weren't winners. They they didn't know how to conduct themselves off the floor. It was a lot. And it was like, it was a lot of, it's like kind of like what people going through right now with the coronavirus and they got their kids and they find out their kids, oh yeah, they are bad when they go to school because you're with them all the time. That's what it was like. It was like babysitting with them. It was like it was it was a lot, man. It was a whole lot. Like that was probably the most stressful time of my career. Like all the other stuff was like a cakewalk compared to that. So to see what Todd doing right now, that's that's major because he came a long way. Because them dudes were a hot mess out there. The good stuff. This might lead into uh, the next one. Um, what is the strangest thing a player has done outside of the basketball court? Outside of the basketball court? I'm trying to figure out which one. <laughs> uh, I don't that's a That's a good one. Strangest. Quincy Diggs, when he's at University of New Orleans, like any time, like, and he went, he actually had to he left University of New Orleans when we, the program for it, he went to Akron. Two things, when he got mad or him and Joe Pashnack would argue, he would go missing in practice and nobody would ever know where he was. And if he could, if we were practicing the main arena, 
he would stay at the very top of the practice and tell people he was really at practice. A lot of now he would stay at the top. And to me, that's like the most weirdest thing is like, I just didn't feel like practicing. They said, well, like, why would you tell people to use practice? Well, bro, I was at practice. I was at the top. I just didn't feel like practice. One, he goes to uh, Akron and he gets arrested for running from the police for no reason. <laughs> I was like, yo, Quincy, why are you running? He's like, it was the police. Well, I was supposed to do. They came to me, so I just ran. Like, yo, like, but did you do anything? No. That's that's Quincy Diggs. Anybody know Quincy Diggs? Quincy Diggs is an awesome human being, but he is by far the weirdest human being ever. And then I would say, matter of fact, I got another one. Like, uh, we had a kid here at Coastal who never worked out, a kid named Josh Coleman. Only thing he did was swim. His whole offseason, no condition, no lift. And he's the biggest, strongest dude on our team. That's all he did was swim. And Coach was okay with it. Like, he practiced, like, with our team, but he never worked out. And, like, he actually was, like, one of the better defenders, big men in our league. But we call him smooth. Wow. Um, now, if you had a chance, because you work with Cliff Ellis, so you've been with some good guys, but if you had a chance to work for anyone in men's college basketball, like, who would that be? Like, who do you look at and be like, man, I would love to work with that guy, you know, or something like that? I only get one. Um, <laughs> you got a couple? You can I'm name a, a couple? I'm going a, to I'm a, uh, name three. One, Billy. Billy Donlin, uh, because uh, he, showed me I, he showed me I can do it. I believe I can do it, but he showed me I could do it. It's the difference between, uh, you know, pushing somebody to that limit, he showed me that it's, it's possible. Like, I, the way I view basketball is a little bit different. I always thought uh, I would be a long-time assistant with somebody just because I can recruit and get guys better. But he made me look at it differently uh, from an aspect like, yo, I can be a head coach. Because I, I, I can I, I figured some things out. I don't know all the answers, but I figured some things out. Um, two... I would say Frank Martin. I love Frank Martin. Like me and him got me and him got our beefs all the time, but he like he he reminds he's the closest thing to Rex Morgan that I probably will will, will have at this point in time. You know what I mean? Rex, I know uh, Frank Martin through Rex and and hugs, but I've become a lot closer to Frank Martin uh, from that aspect because he reminds me so much of what Rex was. I'm talking about not as a coach, but as a person. You know what I mean? So to me, they got some similar ways. And Rex let me do my thing, and I was successful. Uh, third, I would say uh, he's not a head coach yet, but I think that he will be. Uh, Alvin Brooks the third. Me, me and AB3 are really close, and we don't ever talk basketball. So to me, uh, a person who feel appreciated gonna always do more than what's expected. And when you got somebody who who love you and who's in your corner as a person, it's huge. Like to me, you run. I'm like I still got a player mentality. At times, you run through a brick wall for him. You know what I'm saying? So like a guy like him, uh, I would I would say because we are so close. Like we really close. Like we, like I said, we don't we don't never talk basketball. We just talk about life. We talk about his kids. He asked about my mom. Um, we talk about like different ways where we can figure out some things with life. But I would say those three. Awesome man, three good guys, three really good guys. Uh, what's the biggest accomplishment you have experienced since you've been a college coach? Uh, accomplishment. Uh, I'm gonna throw you a curveball. I don't. I don't feel like I, I've accomplished a lot. In my my personal opinion, I could say like I produced you know guys that were pros and this that, and third. Whether I did, had them in AAU prep school or even a kid that we have here right now who was, one, was basically freshman year that nobody really recruited, um, and guys who won Southland MVP that nobody recruited. People may say has been successful. Uh, until I'm in a situation where I can really put other people on, I'm not successful. You know what I mean? Yes, I've, I've helped out some guys in, in some ways, but until I can be able to do some of the things that, like, the guys at the top doing, where they can pick up a phone call and say, yo, hire this dude, 
and they getting hired, then I'm not successful. You know what I mean? Obviously, uh, winning a conference championship game or, you know, winning, I don't know, one of those, like, you know, winning a conference title or something like that, going to the tournament. Yeah, people see that as being successful. To me, I think it's a lot deeper than the basketball, like changing people's lives. So if anything, I would say is, you know, getting somebody out of jail. You know, I got the Mario Mayfield out of jail and wound up being in his wedding. Um, and, and he was a pro, and obviously he held beer, go from uh, San Angelo's to Little Rock and so forth. Yeah, I would say I would say something like that, or helping a kid uh, – not commit suicide. That's to me. That's successful. Like all the court stuff. That's that's, that's why I, I, that's why I identify as success. Not not what I'm doing as a basketball coach. If people just know me as a basketball coach, was recruiting that had this amount of pros and stuff like that, they can have that. Like I'm I'm cool with all that. I don't I don't want to be one of the greats. I want to be one of the real ones. Somebody who made a real impact on life. Like I think that's my purpose. Awesome answer, man. Um, what <laughs> this might throw you for a loop? What movie or TV show title best describes your week? My week? Uh, I'm gonna say uh, Django. Like people don't know, like my circle, they call me Django. Like I might change my my Twitter handle to Django. This series. You know, I get to get a true story about it. Uh, our first was at uh, Abilene, and uh, I had like the at the time the, the Capris and the polo on, and Ted Crash says to me like, "Bro, like, like go and let you dress like that." And in my mind, I'm thinking of the girl who asked Django is like, "You mean you really want to dress like that?" And I was like, "Yeah, man." And, and what I said to him was like, "Yeah, I'm out here. I'm out here recruiting, man." So. You know, at the end of the day, like, like it, it kind of put me in that same mode. Like, yeah, like I'm out here recruiting, so yeah, so yeah, I would, I would necessarily say, I'll say Django. Yeah, I think I want to say Django. I like that. I like that. What's your favorite word or phrase? <laughs> uh, I was still one from my my great grandmother. Uh, be mindful of who you are, why you on earth, your reputation, and live longer than you. Yeah, Deep so I'm, house. yeah, I'm real big on that. Your reputation will live on you. So I would say a little bit. I I, I take it, you know, personal a little bit. Uh, I would even say sensitive when I'm transparent. You know, I'm vulnerable about it. Like when people, you know, think that I'm some a certain kind of way or whatever. Like yo, you don't know me, but then I'm mindful enough to know. You know, if you don't know me, don't take you know, don't take what other people say personal because you don't really know me. Mm. What's the uh, best piece of advice you've ever been given? That right there, don't take everything personal. Like, I took everything personal because I felt like I, I, I worked a lot of dudes and things like that. Uh, and then the second part of that was probably you don't get your fruit of your labor. Actually, my, my fellow friend of mine, uh, J.D. Byers, actually told me that. He's like, yo, you, so you've done a great job everywhere you've been, but, you know, if you really look at your resume, you don't always get the fruit of your labor. So I think those two things, those two things were to me like stuck with me. Mm, okay. Um, where is your happy place? Because you know, things don't go right some days. Like where's your happy place? Ooh, uh, being in the gym, outside being in the gym, I think that's cliche. Uh, and being with my family. Uh, outside of that, hiking. When I was in Utah, I was happy. Like, those dudes made me stressed out a lot, but I was happy. Like, I, anytime I wanted some peace and serenity, I would go hiking. I remember Steve Forbes, I posted something. He's like, man, you, you're a dude from Baltimore, you hiking and snowboarding. Where, where they do that at? Like, uh, uh, you know, you get a lot of peace out there. Like, the air is good. Like, it's the most craziest thing. I'm I'm out at Zion National Park and deers are walking up on you. Like it's the weirdest thing in the world. Like when we get off, I definitely see the video. Like I'm I'm sitting here filming and deer will up. It's the craziest thing and squirrels running through your feet. I'm from Baltimore. Squirrels run, scared of us. So they scared we're gonna shoot them with BB guns or something. So uh, that's that's 
like if I could think of a, a peaceful, happy place, like anytime I'm around like nature and environment. I'm a city city dude, but like I like the I like the I like nature. I went to school for agriculture. People don't know I used to farm. Baltimore City and farm. Piney West Country Life School. Wow. That's something I didn't know right there. Yeah. Um like you're like you're not a um self promoter. I know that just you know, being around you, especially the last few weeks more than anything. Um, if you had to choose three adjectives to describe yourself, which would you choose? You know what? I, I, I really don't know. Uh, it's kind of like what a, uh, <laughs> a, little, a little baby say, I leave it up to the people. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I really don't know. Uh, I think I, I'm, I'm determined, I'm hardworking. I think I'm a lot of things, but you know, everybody. I I actually asked that to one of my players, and or a couple of my players, and they they really couldn't say that. And I really don't know, because I think I'm a I'm always evolving, always growing. But you know, one thing that never changed about me is my work ethic, uh, my passion for basketball, um, and my faith. Like those things have never changed. That that actually that's a question. Like I'm gonna write in my journal and try to really figure that out. I I I I've asked people that, but I never really thought about it myself. Hmm. Um. So yeah, think about that, man. But you did still get a couple of good answers. What um, what person and or event has had the most influence on your life? Um. Outside basketball. Uh, I would say uh, Craig Singletary from the uh, Baltimore Palace Center and Ray Lewis. Um, or I would not even just say Ray Lewis. I would say the guys that was on the Ravens team at that time. Um, I was at home in Baltimore. I had gotten to altercation, like my going into my freshman year, and I was work. I was basically uh, one of the kids at the Palace Center, and. Uh, I got into some trouble and I had to basically leave town. So happened at the time I did Toastmasters uh, uh, and I did Able Foundation and the Ravens team, Ray Lewis, Michael Jackson, Tony Saragusa, those guys donated money to a foundation which ultimately helped me go to Piney West Country Life School. Uh, I had the chance to go to like Tilton and all these other places for prep school. And for whatever reason, I just chose Mississippi. I'd never been to Mississippi or none of that, but I was a, I was a kid that I could have went either way. I could have stayed in the streets or I could do what I'm doing now. And I think uh, that was probably the most impactful part uh, because of those people that really believed in me, pushed me to this part, you know. So, and I could say, you know, I, guess I can name drop some people that people would never be familiar with, but those people are a part of me. Um, like when guys hear me talk, they like that's some of the stuff I've been around Ray Lewis. You know, Craig Singletary is Ray Lewis' bodyguard. And now he's Lamar's bodyguard. So I I'm familiar with seeing, you know, those type of guys. But when you're around them dudes, you you become people who you surround surround yourself around. And that's you know, that's through everybody, you know. So I would say those guys, uh Help change my life a little bit in, in that aspect. That helped jump oh, start. Awesome answer, man. I'm glad they did. Um, knowing what you know now, I like to end it with this question: like, knowing what you know now, what would you tell your younger self to prepare for as an assistant coach? Um, not to take anything personal. Not take anything personal. Keep your head down. Uh, stay more focused on what you're doing, not everybody else. You know, it's, it's cool to admire people from afar and then uh, be more vulnerable. It's hard right to go up and tell somebody that you appreciate what they're doing or you like what they're doing and so forth. Uh, I think uh, the Zoom calls and stuff like that, uh, me going to Bible study uh, way more because now we have time throughout this COVID-19 stuff, uh, I've learned those things. There's it's a lot of other assistants that I, I admire from afar. I wouldn't say necessarily looked up to, but I appreciate 
some of the things that they do or things that they've done or stories that I've heard and try to connect with them dudes because sometimes them, some of them people are just like you. And when you find that certain people are that same way, you you narrow things. So I would say that and I would say uh, not over overextending myself. I try to try to be friend too many people. I would say don't 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 overextend yourself. You know, keep your circle so small so only you can see it. Great stuff, man. Um, look, man, I want to thank you again, Patrice, for being a guest on the show and uh, being unmasked. Is there anything you want to say to the viewers before we go? Uh, wear your mask. <laughs> wear your mask. Wear your mask. And uh, no, continue, you know, in this time right now, be a blessing to other people. Uh, whatever you do, have a purpose. Whatever you do, have a purpose. Awesome, man. Well, I want to thank you viewers for watching another great show. Stay tuned for the next guests as we get them unmasked. See you next time and stay safe.